ministers of that church because he is a minister himself. And, you know, when he saw all of those faces that were in the um, historical building, he had some concerns in terms of uh, that being the face of gentrification in his mind because, you know, he saw a lot of folks that probably back in the day would not have even been anywhere near the, that particular neighborhood. But now they are enjoying some nice houses going to a church mm-hmm. over there. Some of them are living far away from there. They might even be living around Duke or UNC's campus, but when it comes time for church, they are ready to come into the building that was a historical African-American building. So uh, I do know that wow. he had some concerns. Him and Aaron had a very deep conversation. I was sitting there listening to it in the middle of it. Could he understand both of their points to some degree, because Aaron, who is an African-American minister and part of the ministerial team for Christ Central, was letting Carl know that that was not their intention, that they did not plan to buy the building, did not plan to take it over or anything of that nature. But, you know, from an outside looking in, that's probably not what folks are thinking or seeing. So I can definitely understand both of their points of view and where they were coming from. But it was definitely interested in hearing that conversation. And at the end, they did find some common ground. They are both ministers, so they did find some common ground, including uh, both of them had lost uh, parents in their lives, uh, Aaron most recently, and uh, Carl not that long ago, too. So they found some common ground just in their life story, and both are activists. So they did find some common ground. So like we were talking about with the conversation with the presidential candidate, anytime we can find common ground, that is a wonderful thing. So I was glad to see that they did not uh, – you know, at, in the end, while they probably agreed to disagree on some things, they did find some common ground as well. Indeed, and we're going to bring that guest in in one second, y'all. It's Straight Talk with Dana Mark. Hi, we're the Goo Goo Dolls. We're fortunate that our daughters have what they need to grow and learn. But that isn't the case for nearly 13 million kids in the U.S. that struggle with hunger. Childhood hunger is a heartbreaking reality that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and provides it to families and children in need. You can help kids in need in your community by visiting feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Uh, All right, uh, Dean. We're back. Yeah. Dean, before we get to the guests, I do want to get to the guests. I just want to clarify a little bit of the story about McDougal Terrace. Since we were talking about it, I do want to just wrap that up. It says at least nine residents of Jones McDougal Terrace public housing community have been taken to the hospital and treated for elevated levels of carbon monoxide prompting officials on Friday, this past Friday, to go door-to-door checking for the potentially toxic gas. A woman was rushed to a local hospital for an evaluation after first responders uh, found elevated levels of carbon monoxide in her unit in the complex, which is located at 1101 Lawson Street. The discovery has heightened fears at McDougal Terrace, where 344 apartments were checked for CO at the complex, which was first built in 1953. It is Durham's largest public housing community, according to uh, the DHA, which is the Durham Housing Authority website, and it has been beset by poverty and violent crime in recent years. The issue came to light when EMS Assistant Chief for Clinical Affairs, Lee Van Fleet, noticed a call on December 23rd for carbon monoxide poisoning, the one confirmed case at the complex. We looked at the history of the calls for service for the month in that location and found that seven other people were transported that month also had elevated levels of carbon monoxide in their system. So that's kind of where they went with that. And like I said, they have been doing some studies on some of the other complexes here in the area, and it looks like a lot of them are facing similar kind of issues as well. But uh, I just want to make a little bit of more details of that particular story. But let's get to our guests and see what they've got to talk about. All right. Thank you for calling Straight Talk with Dina Mark. You are now on the line. Tell us who you are and where you're calling from. <laughs> Hello? Hi there. Hi there. This Hello. is Nicole Witt. With, can you hear me? Uh, we hear you. Yes, we can. Hi, this is Nicole Witt with the Adoption Consultancy. How are you doing, Nicole? I am doing great. How are you guys doing tonight? Doing good. Tell all us right. a little bit about uh Tell us a little about your organization and what you're all about. Like I said, I've met so many great people in the community, and I know that we met and uh, talked about you being on the show. So if you just share a little bit about what you do and what you're all about, we'll go from there, and then we'll just have, like, a conversation about adoption and things of that nature. Sure, yeah, I really appreciate you having me on. Um, so what I – so 
gosh, starting going back several years, uh, my husband and I went through the whole sort of infertility process. Um, and we went through IVF and we went through donor egg and I got very involved with um, the national chapter of um, the National Resolve, which is the um, support group for infertility. And as a result of all of those experiences, uh, I started a local Resolve chapter. So it's basically a support group for people going through infertility. Uh, and I also ended up um, launching the Adoption Consultancy, which basically kind of helps. I, I hold people's hands throughout the adoption process because it is such an overwhelming and confusing process. So we sort of guide people step by step through the whole process, um, enabling them to adopt safely and quickly and ideally with as little stress as possible. And uh, you, know, you said that the reason you got into adoption was because you and your husband were trying to have a baby and uh, were not able to have the baby, so you decided to opt for the adoption route. I know a lot of friends of mine have had similar experiences, and they've sometimes gone and even adopted out of country, because I know one of my friends actually adopted some folks that were from Eastern Europe. I think I've known some folks that have adopted from other countries as well. Um, what has been your experience just with the U.S. adoption? Because I know you just alluded to it a little bit that sometimes folks are feeling that it's a little bit overwhelming to try to adopt in the U.S., and that's why they will sometimes go to a place like Eastern Europe or some of the other countries that might have a little looser um, regulations. Well, right. So what happened actually with my husband and I is that um, we did not end up adopting. We ended up um, using an egg donor to have our children. And part of the reason we did that was because we believed so many of those myths that are out there about adoption, right? We believed that um, that it takes years to adopt. We believed that the birth parents could come back, you know, and, and reclaim their baby and, and things like that. So as I got involved with the um, infertility support group, I learned more and more about this, and I realized, wow, th you know, this is a really great option that people don't really know about. And that's kind of what led me to this path of educating people and helping them throughout this process. But these days, you know, the international adoption landscape is so different than it used to be. So many of the really popular countries are, are closed to U.S. citizens adopting now. For instance, um, Guatemala is closed and Russia is closed and Vietnam is closed and China has a very long wait time. So that, that those opportunities to adopt internationally just aren't as abundant as they used to be. Um, so most people these days, when they really kind of learn about the, the myths versus the realities and the pros versus the cons, do end up pursuing domestic adoption. And I'm imagining that more people are probably looking at adoption also because of the nature of society. Because I know um, I've talked to friends of mine that are uh, late life parents. And part of the reason they're late life parents is because mm -hmm. they wanted to pursue their careers. They wanted to pursue being financially stable before getting married and or having kids. And so for that reason, some of them are did not have their kids until they were well into their uh, late 30s, early 40s. Um, I would even say in some cases maybe even pushing near 50. I mean, I'm almost 60. That's, mm -hmm. probably, that's probably pushing the extreme of the element, so I don't know about that and everything. Sometimes I, that's one of my great, great regrets is I sit there going like so almost 57, be 58 in July, probably missed the baby window in terms of like having children <laughs> and things of that that nature. But then friends of mine, when I mentioned that to them, they're like, Mark, but you could be a mentor. You could have a kid that's a teenager that needs some sort of support in their life. So they're they're not ready to rule it out for me yet. I don't know if I'm ready to rule it out for myself. I have to right. give that some, <laughs> some, some deep thoughts. But I do know that that has been a conversation that I've had with different friends. But it does seem like it's a lot more popular for in vitro and other kinds of ways to have babies that are uh, going to be safe if you're doing it at a later life because of the way society is. Yeah, absolutely. You're totally right. I mean, the average age of marriage has increased. The average age where people start trying to have children has increased. And that's um, that's a big part of it, why you have so many more people who are experiencing infertility than, you know, 10, 20, certainly 30 years ago. Um, so, yeah, so a lot of those people do turn to fertility treatments, which may or may not be successful for them. Some people skip that part of the process and kind of jump right into adoption, whereas other people, 
you know, they might spend years trying to, you know, go through the fertility treatments, and if that doesn't work, then they end up adopting. So, so now they're even, you know, that many years older. So um, I've definitely seen the average age of my clients, you know, increase over the course of the last several years. So that brings me to the question. I mean, like, what has been the youngest client you've had and what's been the oldest client you've had, if you don't mind? I mean, without getting into their names or careers, but right. just in terms <laughs> right. of, like, the, the age range, because getting names and careers both to figure out who they are. But just the average, uh, the longest, the right. oldest age you've had and the youngest age you've had. Well, the youngest I've had was probably somewhere in their very early 20s, maybe 22, 23, something like that. And um, that was a couple who, you know, they knew right away that they weren't going to be able to achieve a pregnancy. You know, they didn't have to spend the time, you know, going through the, the medical workups and the treatments and all that. They had things had happened in their past where they already knew that was going to be the case. So as soon as they got married and wanted to start having a family, they kind of jumped right into adoption. Um, the oldest, well, it, there's, there's sort of two different sides to that coin. The oldest person that I've had adopt um, was, uh, so he was the husband of a couple, but the wife was much younger. So he was actually in his early 70s and she was in her late 30s. Um, so that was the oldest person who I've had adopt. But in terms of the, the couple, you know, when they're more closer in age, I've had several couples um, in their early 50s and maybe one or two in their mid-50s who've successfully adopted. Wow. So you have had some in the 50s that have done the whole adoption and everything. Now, you mentioned earlier some of the myths, and you alluded to some of them, and I, uh, both the myths of adoption and the myths surrounding in vitro, because I know that there's a lot of people, when they think of in vitro, then they automatically go into the, for lack of a better term, the negative aspects of in vitro and some of kind of the genetic planning aspects of that. And that might be partially because I've been judging a uh, festival that deals with science fiction and horror. So I've seen a couple okay. of these films that, 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 that deal with that bad side. But I'm just wondering, so I know that's one of the myths that's out there, but explain to us some of the things that you've heard are myths in terms of uh, both adoption and in vitro, because I imagine there's tons of myths that people have about both. Yeah, well, I, th I think you've hit on a big one for people who aren't, you know, who haven't had to get medical assistance to have a family or they hear about people who are doing that. And I think a lot of people do think, oh, they're interested, you know, in, in the designer babies, right? They want to pick their different features and so on. And that that just doesn't happen. I mean, people who are trying so desperately to just have a child, a healthy child, and to grow their family, um, you know, they, they – don't even want to specify gender because then that's going to take away half of their opportunities right there. You know, they're just happy to have um, a healthy and successful pregnancy. So, um, you know, I, I think that's kind of a big myth that people think that it's, it's going to lead to, you know, like I said, this focus on these designer babies. But I think another myth that's out there about in vitro is that I, I think people think that, okay, if you get to the point of, of IVF to try to build your family, well, then that works. And that's that's what happens. And I, you know, I see so many people through the support group that I run um, that they expect that okay, well now I've gotten to this place. I've, I've, you know, I understand that this is what I have to do to build my family. And then they're shocked when it doesn't work. Um, and in vitro, you know, of course it depends so much on different factors and, and the age of the people involved and so on. Um, but it only works in the ballpark of about a third of a t the time on average. Um, so I think people think that, oh, well, once you get to that stage, that's going to work and that's how you're going to build your family. And that can be a very harsh reality for people who get there and have spent so much emotionally and financially to realize, you know, the majority of the time this doesn't actually work. So I think that's an important myth to dispel before people make that decision about whether or not that's what they want to do. Um, there, there are so many myths with adoption, and, and you're right, I did reference a couple of them. Um, I think, you know, the big one is that 
um, that it takes years and years and years, and it certainly doesn't need to. You know, again, it, it depends on so many different factors and how you approach it and so on. Um, but almost all of our clients adopt within a year. Our average time frame is about six months, so it can certainly go much more quickly than people think. Um, and the other thing is that it's it's legally very safe. That's one thing that so many people are terrified of when they consider adopting. They think that the birth parent.